Bills.com. Let's welcome in our co-hosts on the day, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. I just blew right in today. A lot of breeze out there. A lot of wind. I got a, a text alert on my phone sometime between midnight and one about a possible tornado in uh, South Berkeley County. I'm not sure if we have confirmed touchdown on that or not, but uh, apparently there is a possibility of that, according to the text alert I got from Alert Berkeley. Yeah, De- around 1.30, it was really, really blowing. It was blowing enough to wake me up. So. Yeah, so I, if, uh, if you, anybody saw anything, if you, you know, let us know. Uh, also, let's welcome Delegate Michael Height on the program this morning. Good morning. Great to be here. You two will be hanging around through the uh, 10 o'clock hour as part of the Friday Five. And I want you to know I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> we like being here, Rob. <laughs> hanging out with you. <laughs> he He's such a genuine individual, Mike. He lets his warmth for our presence be known. You can I, feel it, that warmth. I can, yeah. I, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a genuine warmth. Yeah, and it, it makes us all feel much better on the inside. It's not a faux warmth. Uh, no. And, I, I, will, I will reserve judgment until after I hear my intro. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude, dude's been blushing all morning long. Why, Rob? Why? Well, we'll find out at 835 with the uh, official intros here as we welcome in our First guest of the day today, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator Capito, good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. Good morning. Always great to be on. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to have you, and I mean that with genuine <laughs> warmth. In case there is any doubt on your end. <laughs> we did not feel the same verb of warmth, Shelley, as what he did with you. So. Uh. <laughs> I'm sending verve all the way through the phone line this morning as best as I can. Yeah, Shelley, are you getting the verve this morning? I'm getting the verbs and the vibes. Is there that you go. two See? things I seem to be getting? Just stick with the Vs. She, she's getting my warmth. I'm not sure why you guys aren't getting my warmth. Uh, Senator, in a, on a serious note uh, this morning, I'm driving in and I'm hearing State Department uh, officials, uh, reporters at least, uh, bringing along those comments that we are expecting Iran to uh, strike Israel. At uh, some point, uh, they were regarding it as being imminent. Do you have any information on this at all? Well, I don't, except that I think Iran has been uh, threatening this, uh, remembering back that uh, the Iranians or the Israelis uh, did take out seven Iranian military officers about two weeks ago, and that at that point, Iran pledged retaliation. Um, I just think it shows the volatility, the danger. Uh, and also the fact that Iran just wants to weaken really the most solid democracy there is, uh, being Israel in the Middle East, and undermine whatever efforts they have in terms of trying to root out Hamas, because we know Hamas is funded and very much supported by the Iranians. So it is a scary thing. And I'm reading about it now, drones predicted and uh, sort of an overwhelming force type of attack. I think the intelligence hopefully is good and great, and I think we need to keep up our intelligence, which is one of the big debates on Capitol Hill right now, to be able to help the uh, Israelis. I'm I'm not sure if if this is in, if the reports were indicating a direct attack on the land of Israel or perhaps Mm -hmm. something around the globe, because obviously the attack the Israelis had was not in Iran, it was in Syria, as I as I recall. Right, that's correct. So, but what, what well, in regards to your reaction to a direct strike by Iran into Israel, does that up the game to the point where you're now you're thinking about a possible war? Well, I think they are in war right now. You can see that obviously with what's going on in Gaza and also what happened in Israel on October the seventh. I mean, if that wasn't a declaration of of war as that terrorist strike, I don't think I've ever seen one. I just, uh, you know, it is it is frightful times in terms of the instability in that in that region. And then, you know, you see that uh, uh, ISIS attacked uh, Russia in uh, in that in that concert. Uh, I think it just shows you that the geopolitics in that region is uh, who's going to gain superiority. And there's a lot because there's so much going on. Uh, I think uh, people are seeing openings that they hadn't seen before, whether that's Iran or Iran's proxies or the Houthis attacking ships. Uh, it, it's, it is very, very concerning, and that's why I think we need to be strong. We need to have our military ready, but we also need to have our intelligence to be able to help our allies. Uh, Senator, on that on uh, that note, uh, FISA was up for vote this past week, right. and it was turned down in the House. That that. FISA plays exactly into what you're talking about, intelligence. 
It absolutely does, Bill. And uh, I think what that do, what that for those who are not really familiar with that term is it's what we created after 9/11, which is the ability to surveil foreigners, not Americans, uh, and and it, it, to be able to uh, get as much information as we possibly can and intelligence. And we found in 2020 with the Russia hoax and all that that there was absolute abuse of this uh, FISA process by the FBI. But I think it's important for people to know that the um, revisions and the improvements and the corrections and reforms are in this new FISA Act. So I'm hoping they can get it over the uh, over the uh, doorstep over there on the House, but. You know, 19 Republicans voted against it. All the Democrats voted against it. Uh, I don't want a terror attack on our soil. We have to have FISA to prevent these things. We have to have FISA in the right way. And I think this bill would present that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what they, they're intermingling other parts of the FISA bill in, right. and what they're trying to uh, renew at this point in time. Yeah, I hope some sanity prevails because we have to have tools such as that. Right. I mean, you saw the FBI director, Chris Ray, said yesterday that uh, this this would help us to be able to detect something like uh, ISIS attacking at a concert or a big venue, those kinds of things. These are the kinds of uh, really important intelligence that we need. And, uh, you know, we don't want to infringe on anybody's American rights. And I, I absolutely believe that to my heart. But, uh, you know, these are most of this. And I would say the entirety of it is surveilling foreign actors, those that are uh, probably uh, in, in more suspicious kinds of environments. Senator, you brought up earlier uh, proxies, and it seems like Iran has, has been fighting uh, through proxies for quite some time um, with Israel. So it, I believe Israel's at war, um, but they're, they're at war with, it seems like, all of Iran's proxies and, and not uh, specifically with, with Iran. However, uh -huh. it seems like Israel could, is is in a uh, a state where they may be vulnerable at this point and uh you know the this administration <clears throat> excuse me this administration seems to be weakening on their stance on israel israel so do you think that there's a possibility iran sees this as an opportunity to strike themselves and bring full war to israel well, I do think that uh, the Iranians are a lot of things, but uh, not opportunistic is not one of them, and also very, very smart, and, and so I, and also a, a major enemy of Israel. So, I mean, the, that is going on for decades. So I, I think you're right. I think if if you can stretch Israel as thin. Uh, decay some of the support. And you do see that here in our country where um, the president is, I think, weak in his response, but he's also, it's confusing. Is he is he saying a ceasefire? Is he not? Is he saying return the hostages? Is he not? Is he supporting Israel? Is he not? And, you know, those kinds of wavering positions are exactly what Iran would like to see, because then that that foments distrust within Israel, probably, and then also here, our greatest ally, and then, and then in the region. And, and so I think if we can get to a ceasefire where we have the release of the hostages and pull the temperature down, would absolutely be the best scenario. But I think, obviously, Iran is always looking for an opportunity, and this may present an opportunity for them. I hope not. I hope by exposing this today and making it the topical news of the day, it may push back any kind of uh, aggressive action by Iran. Uh, Senator, let me uh, add something else to that. Uh, you gave several descriptors to Iran earlier. I would add another one, and that is patience. We saw when their leading general was assassinated a few years ago, they waited for a couple so years to retaliate. Uh, they choose their time, and they don't base it upon emotion as much as timing. So this is what alarms me about what we're seeing today, uh, that mm -hmm. we may see retaliation today but more than likely we'll see retaliation a few months down the line when we let a guard down I want to change right. the uh, subject matter here for a yeah. moment uh, april 9 you penned an op-ed calling for uh the senate to conduct a full impeachment trial for mm -hmm. secretary mayorkas and what makes this interesting to me is you're not in an election year 
usually this is something you hear about when someone is trying to get some conservative bona fides with their base in a primary. You're not in that situation, yet you still are calling for this impeachment trial. Well, I think impeachment is serious. It's it's not a uh, frivolous and shouldn't be a frivolous action. And I, I am concerned that that you know, we, this will now be my third impeachment trial since I've been in the Senate and, and never having had any other impeachment uh, in, in the rest of my service. Here's, here's the way I look at it. I think that in the Constitution, uh, we are given the responsibility and the duty to try all impeachments. And that's what's happened in the past. These are serious allegations. We see nine million people. We see we see the law sort of flaunted in the immigration area. We see I mean, I was listening to CNN on my car radio coming down, uh, coming home last night, and even there featuring reports of illegals coming across the border. So you know it's, it's deep, and, uh, you know, it's up over 400 percent on a monthly uh, average. Mayorkas, you know, this lays at the hand, at the, at the foot of Mayorkas. He's head of Homeland Security. He's the one that puts the directives of how fast is asylum, how, how, who gets parole, Parole is supposed to be on an individual basis. They're doing blanket parole, which is putting hundreds of thousands of people into this country. We have known terrorists that have tried to enter the country. I mean, I, I think we need to hear all this, and we need to hear what his responsibility has been. And the reason I penned the letter is because it, it appears as though Senator, uh, Senator Schumer is going to bring it up and then ask for a tabling vote, which would essentially uh, short-circuit any of the process. And uh, I, I think that that hurts the constitutional responsibility that we have and also the responsibility to to people to hear this full out trial. Um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that an impeachment of Mayorkas, a full impeachment will not happen because it has to have, you know, uh, over 60 votes in the Senate. And that would probably be too big a stretch. But don't you think he's sort of like the fall guy? Because I'm, I'm sure he's getting his marching orders um, from the administration um, and and just doing what they they want him to do is it, was well, it secretaries don't establish their own policy is what you're right. saying. Right. You know, I think I think that's a logical argument, and 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 I do see that. But here, I'll give you a good example. Like yesterday, Secretary Mayorkas was in front of our Appropriations Committee. I know him because I was the ranking member on that committee. We've had more than a few meetings together, and the first question I ask him is. How many border agents do you have? How many do you need? We're funding. You know, it's about funding. We're funding another 250 or 150. How many do you have? And he goes, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I mean, that's a basic <laughs> question. And I know he knew the answer to that. But, and but, I think he, he didn't want to say it because they, they, we've given them the authority to hire up to make the border more secure. And they can't do it because who wants to be a border agent with the way they treat them? I mean, and the way they're being treated in their jobs. Sure. But, you know, so that was the first time I thought to myself, he's being very deceptive here, and I didn't appreciate it. Well, a kind of follow-up on that. Uh, the uh, uh, This is only the second time in our history that a cabinet secretary has been impeached. The first time was shortly after the, second, uh, after the Civil War with uh, Belknap, who was a Civil War general. Uh, are we... Are we going down a slippery slope that we're using the impeachment tool way too frequently and not going after the people they who actually should be going after? You know, Bill, I think that I think you're making you're raising a good point. And that was initially what I said when I heard they were going to the House was going to impeach Mayorkas. And I, and I was like, well, let's wait a minute here. You know, this it is getting too frequent. And and what 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 is the um, what is the background of this? But here's where we are. The House moved forward on this it is our duty as the senate to hear the whole trial and that's what we need to do if we don't let's put the shoe on the other foot donald trump wins in 2024 there is no way especially if the house becomes democrat which could happen that they will not initiate impeachment against donald trump day one probably and then if it comes over to the senate which is a republican senate let's just say that happens and we say we're not going to listen to that. We're just going to vote to table it. Then what's happened? Uh, you know, so let's go through the process. Uh, I agree that we don't we shouldn't be using this as a sharp edge tool to just stick fingers in people's eyes. But we are where we are. We need to hear the full and open uh, impeachment trial and make our judgment. Hey, before you go, Bill, we only have three minutes left. I want to get to another piece of legislation, Senator 
Capito was a co-sponsor of, and this has to do with the Biden administration's greenhouse emissions performance measure uh, right. final rule being imposed on state departments of transportation and metropolitan planning organizations. The Senate approved the Congressional Review Act joint resolution of disapproval by a vote of 5347. What does this mean for West Virginia, Senator Capito? Well, this means that West Virginia can use our transportation dollars for the flexibility issues that we always have. We're always Our, our DOT does look for uh, areas of congestion like some, some areas up in the eastern Panhandle where we could reduce emissions. But let's let each state make that decision. Here's the important thing for this. I negotiated the highway bill three years ago with Senator Carper. We talked about this greenhouse gas emission provision over and over again, and we both and we agreed in the end to leave it out. This is an overreach by the administration. This is not Congress's will. We make the laws. They should stick to what we do and then make the regulations around it. And this is another instance where the courts have already come in and stayed this rule. Now, Bill, please go. <laughs> no, no, I, I was just uh, going down the path that we had before. So I, um, yeah, go ahead. All good. All right. Senator Capito, final thought belongs to you. I know you have to go in a minute or so. Well, you know, I think that uh, the Masters is going on. I can see a dogwood blooming. So it's spring. Let's have some good and happy thoughts as we move <laughs> into the weekend. And I had a wonderful time at the hospice. I got to see Bill. Hospice is a panhandle is a special place. Yeah, I was going to I mention that before we go. Uh, they, we as the hospice board and we as all the hospice uh, uh, volunteers which do a great job. We're thrilled to see you the other day. You had uh, uh, you had so much grace to uh, to any gathering, and uh, you well, said the you. right thing. So appreciate it very much. Well, let me tell you this: I did put my glasses on and watch the eclipse. So, so Chris <laughs> Strobel is is not as <laughs> out there as we thought. <laughs> do you do you have a picture of you with the glasses on, Senator? I do. Do you want me to send it to oh, you? Oh, I would love that. That would be awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Have a great day. All Thanks right. so much for calling in. Thanks, Thank Senator. Thanks. Bye-bye. Senator Shelley Moore Capito, and a special thanks to uh, Kelly Moore, who is my liaison through the senator's office to get these things set up and uh, operating smoothly. I want to go back to the Mayorkas situation. And the reason why I brought up that Senator Capito is not in a an election year uh, is that typically when you are being primaried, and oftentimes you're being primaried by somebody further to the right than you in the Republican Party, unless your name is Height or Hornby, in which case you don't get primary, which is great. Congratulations to you, Thank you. by Thank the you. way. Uh, you're, you're trying to, you know, this, something like this looks good on your resume with conservatives, but she's not in a primary election situation where she's getting somebody further to the right who's calling her out, which makes me believe even more that her interest in this is substantial and genuine in regards to Mayorkas not doing his job. And your point, Mike, is a good one, and that is that isn't he just following the Biden policy? But Republicans are saying he's not even doing that effectively. He's incompetent for the job. And she gave an example there about the number of border agents, and either he didn't want to answer it or he didn't know the answer one way or the other. But the press release, the op-ed that Senator Capito published, said there was over 189,000 illegal border crossings in February alone a substantial increase over the previous February. That's 6,500 plus people a day in the 29 days of February coming across the border illegally. Just visualize that in your head for a moment. Well, I think she brings Every up, day. She brings up a good point where she's in the Senate and he's already been impeached, so she has a job to do regardless of, of whether it's a, 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 a political move or not. She has, as a senator, a job to do because the House has already impeached him. So you go back and I talk about he, he just looks like the fall guy. We, we are having a presidential election, and I think this um, looks bad on our current administration, that this impeachment is more of an, an impeachment of, of the Biden administration and their handling of the southern border. Um, why, do they, why they don't go after Biden himself? Who knows? I mean, they're impeaching him about something else. So um, His son. this right. So this seems like there, this is just a, a political way of of bringing down the Biden administration during a presidential election year when he's running for reelection. And I'm not saying for a second that, that this guy, my or or the Biden administration doesn't need to be held account for the disaster at the southern border because they absolutely do. 
I am just concerned with the number of impeachments I'm seeing in politics right now Fair point. and the way we're handling it. Yeah, and the Democrats started this uh, when they impeached Trump uh, yes. a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, but, but the Republicans are just adding fuel to the fire. I think it's going to become a common tool now. I hope Every, not. Uh, but I bet it is. Every time a secretary, a uh, cabinet member doesn't do something they like, they're going to go for impeachment. It does give visibility. It does give a forum to uh, uh, to talk to. But there should be more effective ways, as there has been through the bulk of our history, as, of, as utilizing impeachment. Again, this is only the second cabinet member that's ever mm-hmm. been impeached mm-hmm. the first one deserved it he was taking kickbacks a lot of kickbacks uh shortly after the civil war uh he deserved it i'm not sure, sure that current cat oh you would think if that's the case over the years been other cabinet members that deserve it as well nobody has risen that's that threshold and you know when we talk about the border and you, you'll hear a lot of of people saying well you know if the border is such a disaster why didn't the republicans vote for the border bill and, you know, why were they so against the border bill? If, if they wanted to stop things uh, the, the way things are happening at, at the border, they should have voted for that bill. Well, the problem with Washington and the way these bills are constructed, there is so much other crap in the bill that, that when you look at it as a whole, you're like, you know, I want more money for the border. I want things to stop at the border, but I can't, I can't approve, you know, a Five billion or ten billion dollar loan to to the Ukrainians in a southern border bill. You can't you can't combine these things together and then ask me to vote for them. You're generally right, but I do not think this this the border bill that we saw earlier had a lot of additions added to it. It was it, it pretty, did have some pork in it. it. It had some pork, but but it was pretty clean by Washington standards. is very clean, and the reason that the Republicans decided not to vote for it uh, was it did not go far enough, yet it was a lot of stuff that they had previously had in their House pass and, bill. And and their their attitude was a lot of these things can be taken care of right now by executive order. He has the, the, the Biden administration has the power to stop these things right now. He doesn't need all the money that he's asking for to get this done. He could stop it right now. There, that point... How maybe, about how about slow it, Bill? Maybe slow. And I'm not I'm not saying you're not right, Mike. I don't know. I've looked at this quite a bit, and there's so darn confusion. Confusion. What power the uh, uh, the president had? Uh, Trump exercised some of those executive or, executive orders. They were pulled back. They were the the court system pulled. No, no, back. no, no. The Biden administration pulled those. No, back no, no. Day some one. others, some others, they pulled. Many back of back. those that were in place, the Biden administration yeah. pulled day one out, like the. the the remain in Mexico policy and, and for for those seeking asylum. There were a lot of those types of things that that he got rid of day one. And then there's an influx of, of illegal immigrants coming across the border. He could have stopped a lot of these things. He didn't want to look. He wanted it to look like Trump's policies were bad, which is why he got rid of them. And now he's got the, the problem he has at the border right now. He okay. could stop a lot of this right now. OK, I yield to that, Mike. I yield to it. I think you're right. However, come back to that bill that uh, Langford and others put together. That was a very healthy, a very good step forward that would get around some of these criticisms of what the president can and cannot do. And that, unfortunately, was voted, never saw the light of day in the House. I think that was an opportunity missed. And on that note, we end our first segment provided to you by our friends at WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center, leading healthcare here and everywhere. Also by the